Let's get into subsetting. It's one of my favorite topics. Uh, the tidyverse is exceptionally powerful for subsetting data. Um, if you subset data in uh, base R, if you have experience with it, it's quite tedious and it's very error prone. So um, this is something that's really, truly wonderful about the tidyverse. Um, so I think I'll do a little bit of the recap for the basic R. I know we just did a lot of data imports. So we probably don't need that, but um, remember that R functions is a calculator and you can use the C function for the combine function to combine things together to create vectors. Um, that's what we call something that's a one-dimensional data object. Um, and we can use the arrow, which is basically the sort of Pac-Man mouth looking symbol and a dash um, to assign values to objects. Um, and it's important to remember that if you don't reassign data and you modify it, but just print it out to the screen, it's not actually gonna modify the data. So keep that in mind um, if you really wanna change the data. Uh, and our STR function, which we just saw in the lab can be really helpful. Um, so can class and link uh, at taking a look at information about the data object, um, but head and tail as we've seen are, are very useful. So don't forget that there's a helpful cheat sheet for each day, and you can find that on the resource page. All right, so in this lesson, we're going to go over a variety of things. We're gonna cover a lot of topics today. So we're gonna go over ways that we can look at our data. Uh, this is extremely important after we import our data to take a look at it and make sure that things are as we expect. We're gonna talk about creating data frames and creating what we call tibbles, which we briefly talked about earlier, and what those are. Um, we're going to talk about making new variables, making row names, making row names from a column, talk about renaming our columns. This is something that's super important for making your life easier in the future. Uh, subsetting rows, super important. How do we just work with the data that we are interested in out of a larger data set? How do we only work with certain columns? How do we get rid of data that we don't want? Um, and we'll also talk about ordering columns and rows. So a lot to cover. So again, um, the tidyverse is really, really helpful for this. Um, and we're mostly gonna be focusing on a package called dplyr or dplyr. Um, and if you're interested in more resources on this, please check out these. So what the heck is, dplyr, it's a weird name, right? Um, so according to the person that made it, uh, the D is for data frames and plyr is supposed to evoke flyers. So it's sort of about, you know, messing with our data or modifying it, um, really gets into the concepts of wrangling data. So that can help you to remember the name. Um, but you don't need to necessarily remember that you need to load dplyr because when you load the tidyverse, it will load dplyr as well as lots of other useful packages. All right, so first things first, we need some data to work with. Um, so we're gonna work with some data called MT cars. So if you were to go to your console and type in MT cars, you'd see a bunch of data pop up. And this is because there are several data sets that are part of R and it's for you to play around with. Um, and so because I want to keep my empty cars the way that it is, I'm going to assign it to something called data frame so that I can continue to modify it if I'd like to. So I could write this in a chunk. I could press my play button. I have it still previewing up in my inline part here. And so I see here that this is what the data looks like. Um, got different cars and lots of different aspects about those cars. All right, some helpful functions for better understanding your data. It's really often super useful, especially when you're checking your work, to know the size of your data. And so there's a few really helpful functions for this. Um, the first one is DIM, which stands for dimensions, um, and then number of rows or N row and number of columns and call. So if we were to use that function on our data frame that we just made, 
we see that it's um, 32 by 11, and it gives us the number of rows first and then the number of columns. And I can be sure of that because I can use my n row function to verify that it's 32 rows first and 11 is my column numbers, which I could also get if I was wanting just the number of columns, I could use n column. I see 11 there. All right. Um, in addition to the head and tail function that we've been using, um, we've especially been using head, the glimpse function is extremely useful. Um, but it's, it takes a little bit to get oriented. So glimpse is going to basically flip our data sideways. And that's really helpful for being able to view a lot of the values and get a better sense of the data. And it's also going to show us all the columns. So usually when we're previewing data in R, um, we're not always going to necessarily see. So here I am. Um, in this case, we can see all of our columns because we don't go off of the page, if you will. But sometimes we'll have way more columns, and then we can't see them all. And R will just give us a little preview at the bottom that there's more columns. But that's not so nice if we really want to know what the what those columns look like. And so we could instead do glimpse data frame and take a look this way. And so here, just to orient you, now we're seeing the column names up here. And then these are the values. So this is the first value, the second value, et cetera. And so it's really helpful for very large data sets. Sometimes, though, you want to see sort of like what does the middle of my data kind of look like? You've seen the head, you've seen the tail, you've seen a big section of it with glimpse, but you're still a little unsure of what the data really looks like. Maybe you've looked at it with, you know, you've opened the um, view to take a look at it um, by going into your environment and pressing on it, and you can scroll around and look at it. But if it's it's really big, you might want to do something that's that's useful for taking a random sample of the data. And to do that, we can use something called slice. Oops, sample. And so this is also from the dplyr package. And it's going to take our data, which is df, and we can specify the number of rows, random rows that we want to pull out. Or we can specify the number or the proportion of rows that we'd like to take a look at. And so if we say that we want to look at data frames and we want to look at uh, five rows, then these are five random rows. So it's not the same as if we were to use head data frame. I'm switching down here just so we can review it easily at the same time. So here we can see that Mazda, there's two Mazda cars that are at the very beginning of this data set. But here when we use slice sample, we don't see that because we're looking at some rows that are deep within the data set. They're not necessarily at the top. It's important to note that this is a random sample. So here we have Hornet sport about as our top. Uh, but if we did this again, we're going to get something else because it's just a random subset. And again, we can also do a proportion. So say I wanted to see 30%, I could say proportion equals 0.3. And I'm going to get a subset that's a little bit larger. So that's useful to know about. Another really useful package is the skimmer package. Um, and so it's not part of the tidyverse. You, um, you would need to install and then load it. Um, but we can do really nice things with it um, and get these really fancy outputs. So all you have to do is this one function, skim. And then you see here, it gives us information about the number of rows, the number of columns. So we got our dimensions. Um, it tells us how many, uh, what, what different types of columns we have. It's showing that it's all, uh, we've got 11 numeric columns. 
And then uh, it gives us information about if there's missing variables or missing values in our variables. In this case, we don't have any missing values, but we'll see more about that later. Um, it gives us the mean, standard deviation, um, a histogram, and some information about the sort of the range of values across, across each of the variables. So I already have skim installed. Skimmer, that is. If you didn't, you would need to do install packages in quotes, skimmer. Um, but then you could use, so I don't need this, um, library skimmer. I would say that it's, it's in there. That's the output that we want to see. And then here I'm seeing a preview of the skimmer in my R markdown, which isn't so great. It's much better in our console. So you can see more of the information here. All right. So when we want to create a new data frame, there's a function called data.frame. And um, that's how we would create an old school data frame. Um, but we're going to be mostly focusing on tibbles, which are the tidyverse version of data frame. Um, but basically, if you wanted to update any data that was some other class form, it wasn't quite yet a data frame, you could use this data frame function to create that data frame. And remember, a data frame is basically something with a lot of columns and a lot of rows. Notice here that it's got some row names. So this one, this what looks like a column, doesn't have anything above it. Um, and these are row names. Uh, when we use read.csv, which is from base R, this is not our read R function, which is read underscore CSV, then we're going to end up automatically creating this old version of a data frame. Um, but we're interested in focusing on tibbles for the most part. We do want to point out data frames because you're probably going to see them a lot in your work. Um, so that's why we covered that. But we're going to be talking mostly about these tibbles. And a lot of the functions that we're showing throughout the course can also be used on data frames. Uh, but tibbles are these really fancy, nice um, data frames. And so we can make them using the tibble function. So if we had a data frame, like a data frame that we just made, um, we could convert it into a tibble. Um, so we already have a DF that we made, you can see it here in my environment. I can use the tibble function to make this now into a tibble. And then if I take a look at it here, I can see now that I have lots of columns and rows and I have this other information that I don't get with a data frame, which is class information about the variables. And we'll be talking more about classes soon. So I'm not going to focus on that. Uh, it also tells us the dimensions, which is nice. We don't get that when we just look at the, the regular data frame version. And so we don't even really need to use the head function because when we just type in the name of the table, we're going to basically see a subset of the data, which is nice. And so when we use the reader package, we are using the read underscore CSV um, to get data imported from CSV files. And that's going to automatically create tibbles instead of the data frame. And so hopefully you can start to see how some of these tidyverse packages are, are working together. They're really a cohesive set of packages that, that help you do data analyses. 
So just a, a summary of all of that. So it's important to notice when you have an underscore or a period, you may come across read.csv. Um, that's using base R, and that's going to create these traditional data frames, whereas underscore from the read R package of the tidyverse is going to create these tibbles. You can use data frame to convert into a data frame, and you can use tibble to convert into a tibble. All right, you may have noticed that something happened when we converted to a tibble that was maybe not good. So if we just take a look at the first two rows here, I'm using the head function to do this. So, so far we've mostly just been using the head function as is, but we can specify with an argument of n equals, and I can say how many rows I wanna preview. So here I'm just looking at the first two rows of the data frame version. And I can see that I have row names, but when I look at the Tibble version, my row names are gone. So I have lost the information about which car is which row, and that's pretty important. So what do we do about this? Well, there's a really nice function, part of the tidyverse, part of the Tibble package, and it's called row names to column. So it really intuitively uh, tells you what it's gonna do. It's gonna take the row names and create a column. So we're gonna have some of these like green boxes. Um, if you can see green, might be shade of gray or some other color. Um, and it's gonna show general format, not the code. So here we're showing, generally speaking, that the, you know, some data, say you wanna reassign your data, you need to remember to do that with your reassignment. Um, and you want to convert your row names into a column, then you would use the row names to column name function. You would put the data that you're trying to use and then the name of the new column that you're making for those row names. We can use the row names to column name column function. And we just need to put what uh, data frame we're trying to use, and then the name of the new column for that um, column. So here I'm going to modify my data frame. And currently my data frame is in fact, my DF data object is in fact a typical data frame. I can tell because it has row names. And so now I'm saying row names to column name. And if I forgot exactly what it is, I can just sort of type in row and see it come up if I hesitate. And I'm gonna be using the existing version of the data frame. And I'm gonna create a new variable name called car. And then I wanna take a look at it afterwards. So I'm gonna preview it here. And now I have this nice um, column name for car, which I can refer to now and do things with it easier. Um, because it's the row names. So row names are always gonna be on the furthest left. And we know it's a row name because there's nothing above it. Um, we wouldn't have a situation like that. Uh, we might have like a number or something here if somebody didn't name a column. Uh, and then we would just rename that column to something that we felt was better, which we're gonna go over in just a second. Since we're gonna be focusing on tibbles, I'm gonna now, if you're following along, I'm gonna now create a tibble version of this data frame for us to continue working with for the rest of this um, this uh, lecture. So remember, this was initially my empty cars data, and then I created uh, a column called car using the row names to column name function, um, row names to column, I mean, <laughs> and then I made a table out of that, and it's called TV. And wow, we're voila, we're going to talk about renaming columns now. Okay, so there's a function called rename, and that's what we use for renaming columns. 
And so, for example, um, we have a column in our data called MPG. That's our second column. And let's say that we wanted to capitalize it. I'm not sure why we would want to do that necessarily, but for the sake of showing you how to rename column names, this is what we're going to do. Um, so there's a part of it that's a little counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, we're going to well, first, you know, use the function name, put the name of the data that we're using, and then we're going to list the name that we want, the new name, the equal sign, and the old name. So some people think that it should be the other order more intuitively, um, so that can get you. But if it does, it'll just say that name doesn't exist, do it the other way around, and uh, you'll be fine. So here we have our what was lowercase mpg. We look over here at, at our TB tibble. We see that we have lowercase mpg, but we want to make it uppercase. So uh, we're saying that our new name is capital mpg. And that's what we're going to change out for our lowercase mpg. And we have to tell it which column name we want to change so that it knows. And we have to specify the data set that we're using. And because we want to keep this, we're going to reassign our TB uh, data object. So coming over here, I can rename TB. And don't worry if you're struggling to follow along because we are going to practice all of these things in our lab. So don't worry about that. That's not necessary. Um, but here we're, we're saying that we're going to rename TB. MPG is now going to be a capital MPG. So let's run that and see how it looks. And indeed, we've changed our column. So if I wanted to do a different column, say cylinder, I'd have to say something like this to do that. I'm not going to run that now, though, because my other examples are kind of expecting this. OK, so column names can be super tricky. And uh, I've tried to really make it as clear as I possibly can in this guide that's on our website. Um, and so if you you can click on this link or you can go to our course. Here we are at the course website. If you were to go to the resource tab and you're getting confused about when to use quotes and when to use backticks, you can click on this guide here. And there's some nifty tables and a bunch of examples listed for various functions. And so um, You'll you'll start to notice that we use quotes sometimes and we use backticks sometimes in R. And I know it's very unfortunate that there's some inconsistency in the way that R is uh, developed. Part of it is because different people develop different packages and they just did it differently when they created it. Um, but also there's some meaning behind some of it. So. Typically, when we have a character string, meaning like a word or a phrase, we're going to use quotes. And that can be single or double quotes. But when it's something more atypical, like it has some unusual punctuation um, or something like that, we're going to use backticks for that typically. But column names are really weird. And so we've we've put made this uh, chart for you that you can find here. Um, to see how you should be working with that function um, in R. Do you need to memorize this? Absolutely not. Um, Ava and I and Cliff, you know, when we're writing in R, sometimes we forget that this function does it this way or that way. And so we try it out. It doesn't work. We use the other way. Um, so don't get too disturbed by the concept that, you know, there's some inconsistency here. Just try out what you think makes sense or you know come back to this website and then um, take a look at it there. Um, so in this example, I'm showing you an atypical column name. 
we suggest that you avoid using atypical column names in general, and then you don't have to worry about this at all. Um, so that's probably the best method, but we know that you're going to encounter situations where you're given data that has atypical column names. And so I'm gonna show you how here to create an atypical column name. Um, so say we had an exclamation mark in our column name for MPG. If we were to just write this out like this, it would cause an error. So I'm gonna show that to you now. So I'm using the rename function. I need my TB data and I need to list my name that I want it to be, um, the equal sign and the current name and try not to typo, but you know, it happens a lot. And here I can see, you know, I've got, I've got my, I've got my output. I get an error here because it doesn't like the exclamation mark. Um, so I can rename it then like this. So if I wanted to actually assign it, again, I have to use my assignment arrow and overwrite my TB object to create that. Oops, but I've already, I get an error here because I've already renamed it. So I can't rerun it. But if I just look at TB, now I see that I have this weird column name and so it's got backticks around it. So what are backticks? <laughs> um, so you're gonna run into these a little bit. You can find them on your keyboard, typically near the escape on the left corner. Um, and these are needed anytime we have spaces in column names, numbers without characters, so it's just a number, we'll see that soon a number starting the name or any other type of punctuation. However, underscores and periods are much more tolerated. So we might see that as well. But again, the solution is to just rename your column names to make them nice so that you don't have to deal with this later. And we highly recommend that you do that. And so we do, of course, need to know how to use the rename function. And it tolerates quotes or back ticks if atypical. So it's pretty friendly. So if you copy paste though your code, you should know also that you can run into some issues. And this is something that frequently happens with students. Um, if you copy paste, you're gonna get often, depending on where you're copy pasting from, a curly quote as opposed to the quotes that are typically found in R. Um, so this is what a quote really looks like. It's like a, just a straight line as opposed to this curly line. And R doesn't like it. <laughs> so um, make sure that when you're copy pasting, you're careful. And if you get this error, it's it's saying like, what? This doesn't, this isn't making sense. Then, you know, just you might need to go back and change out your, your quotes and type them in and it will fix it. All right, um, sometimes we have a situation where we want to rename all of our column names. And there's a nifty function for that. Um, and that's the rename with function. And so similar to rename, uh, all the changes here is we add a with. You can see that there's lots of other variations on this. Honestly, I've never really used them, um, but you can do other specific things if you want to. Um, and then there's, it's with, because I get to apply other functions um, to renaming my column names. So there's a function to upper and a function to lower. To upper makes all the letters uppercase, to lower makes all the uh, letters lowercase. And this can be useful because Uppercase sometimes can be a little bit trickier to deal with, or it doesn't look quite as nice. Um, and so it can be nice to be able to, to modify everything all at once. In this case, I have mostly lowercase. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix my TB uh, weird <laughs> uh, MPG column first because gonna be weird and I don't want it to be weird. So I'm gonna put it back like this. 
So the new name that I want and the current name. Um, perhaps it already did something, let's see. Oops, I already have rename with, and I just want rename. All right, it's fixed. But now I want to, so we can take a look, make sure that's the case. It's always good to look. Looks right. So everything's lowercase now. I want to rename all of my column names. So I'm going to use rename with, and I'm going to say to upper. And I'm going to take a look. All right. Now all of my column names are uppercase. So that's what we show here as well. Rename the data set that I'm using, rename with, and to upper. And if I wanted to then undo that and make them all lowercase, I can do so like this, um, just changing this to lower. Oops. And now it's back. All right. So in summary, data frames are simpler versions um, or a simple version of a data table, meaning we have rows and columns. So columns at the top and rows along the side. Tables are a fancier tidyverse version. Um, they're fancier because they give us dimension information. They give us uh, information about the class of the variables and we don't have to deal with row names. So we can do nicer things with the data that's in the row names. Data frames are made with the data.frame function, which come directly also when we're importing from read.csv from base R. But instead, let's focus on read R and the read underscore function, which will create tibbles, or we can convert things to tibbles with the tibble function. If your original data has row names and you're trying to make a tibble, you'll want to use the row names to column function before you convert. The rename function is what we use to rename columns. We can also use rename underscore with if we want to, to change all of the column names at once. And we have our two lower and two upper function for that. Try to avoid using punctuation, using spaces, using numbers. You can use numbers with characters, but don't start things with numbers um, in your column names so that you keep a standardized name. And if you're unsure of what the standard typically is, you can take a look at the website. All right. All right, so subsetting columns. Okay, so if we wanted to just get the data from a particular column and just look at that data, there is a, a function called pull to do that. And so what we have to do here is specify the data that we're trying to use, and then the column name that we would want to pull out from the data. So here we're looking at carb. Um, I could do Whole TB and car. So I just wanted the first column information. So this gives me, as you can see, the values, but they're not really listed in a particularly nice way. They're just kind of shown to me. Um, and so that's just showing the values here. Select is another function that does something similar, but it instead gives us a tiny tibble. So it's basically just subsetting the tibble to be one column. So here I'm just selecting here the MPG column, and now it's displayed like a table. Um, it's just a table with one column in this case, but we could select multiple columns, which we'll see in a second. So instead of pull, I'm gonna say select. And now I can see that I have a different tibble display. 
say I wanted multiple columns, oops, um, I'd have to do it a little bit differently. I'm actually gonna wait till I show that here. So um, I just separate them by, by comma here. I think my MPG is spelled differently still, capitalized, but here I can put my gear uh, column name and, and get the same thing. Again, my MPG is different, so that's why it did work the first time. But I could I could do that here. You may notice that the order of the columns has changed. So, however we specify it in select um, can also change the order, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But it's a way to just get specific columns if we wanted a subset of our data. All right. So, uh, just to really clarify here. If you want just the values, then you need to use the poll function. Um, and you can use poll around select if you want, it's unnecessary, um, but it will work. But really it's so that you get the values. And that can be important because we'll see later that certain functions only work on values or vectors and they don't work on tibbles. Um, but using the select function can be really useful if we have a really large data set and we only want to work with a smaller data set. So we're pulling out, or I shouldn't say that, <laughs> we're selecting for uh, particular columns that we want to work with. Um, but there's some really nice helper functions, they're called helper functions, uh, to help us select specific columns in a more efficient way. So. Uh, if I wanted to know what these were, I could come down here and say tidy select, oops, and then tab over, and it's gonna tell me all of these options. I could look for columns that end with a pattern, that contain a particular pattern. Um, those are particularly helpful. Uh, so I could, get to know all of those. I will say we're most, I mostly encounter using contains, starts with and ends with. And so we're gonna cover those. So I could say that I wanna select, here I'm showing uh, the columns that start with the letter C. Notice that I've used quotes around C. Um, so if you went to our table on our resource page, you would see this. Uh, the reason is because here we're asking it to look for a character value. And anytime we have character values, we're going to need to use quotes. And so if we do that, we would get car, cylinder, and carb coming out. And we don't, that's a lot more efficient than actually writing them out. So sometimes we have giant data sets where we have um, a name appended to all the column names for a particular type of uh, location or something. And then it's it's really useful to be able to collect all of those uh, with the starts with function. So I would do so like this, it's saying skimmer, but it's actually different. Don't worry about that. Um, so let's say I wanna do G instead. There's only one column that starts with G. So I get, the gear, say, I think there's a mold. Yeah, there's a couple for D, so you can play around with that. Again, this is how you would find them. You could just type in tidy select in the console and kind of hesitate, press tab. And the ones that are most helpful, I think, are starts with, ends with, and contains. So contains be something like, I can just do part of a pattern. So, oops. Let's see. Um, oops, I'm trying to do contains and I didn't change my function. Okay. So here there's SP within the variable name. It doesn't start with, I could do ends with potentially, but um, if there's something, typically you'd have a longer column name that maybe has multiple meanings inside of it, um, then you can see how the contains function can be helpful. 
All right. And so then here's just some more examples. I can not only I can combine this with saying like I specifically want the car column and I want to do those that start with D and all I would have to do is just put a comma in between those. And so here I get the variables that start with D and I get the car variable. If I wanted car to show up first, I would just rearrange this. And I would just put car first. And we can see that the order is different. Here, car comes last, just like we specified. And here, it comes first. I could also do multiple tidy helper functions. So I could do starts with and ends with. And it's going to do it in. Um, an or logic. So these do not have to qualify both conditions. I don't have to have columns that start with C and end with R. They can start with C or end with R. And so I would get cylinder and carb, which do not end with R, but start with C, and gear, which ends with R. If I wanted to do multiple patterns, for what I want to start with or contain um, in my in my column names, I can do so using the combine function. And again, I need my quotes for my patterns that I'm looking for, and I just put a, a comma in between. So I could do that here, make this an extra fancy one. I need my combine function, and I'm going to say let's see. Oops, I made an error somewhere. Probably my parentheses. Yep. And there we go. Now I have car first, because it's specified here specifically. And then I have my other C names afterwards, because um, I had already included car. So it's kind of a cool example. It knows that you're, that's fine. It knows that you're asking it to look within the object. Another question? Yeah, you don't have to necessarily like parse your data and now you only work with the smaller data. It could be that you're going to select these columns and ask R to do something special to these columns. We'll see more about that later. Great question. Okay, and then I just wanted to tell you about the where function. It can be really helpful if you have data that has um, lots of character variables and lots of um, numeric variables. And so if you wanted to select the numeric variables and work with them, which is something that often happens because you're applying numeric um, modifications to the data, uh, you can do so with the where function. So you would do that within select. And so uh, you would say the, the data that you're using, and then you would say where it is numeric. So select of the TB data where it is numeric, or this could be character in that case. In our case, we only have one variable that's character. And so now we have lost that and it's just numeric values. And um, going off of Ainsley's question, which is perfect for this, <laughs> um, this is really helpful if we wanted to multiply everything by two, for example, because we couldn't do that before with car. All right, subsetting rows. Um, I think this is even more important. Um, they're both extremely important, though. Um, super nifty function called filter, and filter is going to help us select the values within our data, the rows um, that's, that qualify for a specific condition based on one of our variables or more of our variables. So in this case, I want to know, for example, how many of my cars have an MPG of greater than 20? 
And so I say, I'm gonna use the filter function. I'm gonna say, I'm working with the TB data. MPG is the value that I, or the variable that I want to use a condition on. And every value should be greater than 20. And I see here now that I have 14 that have an MPG greater than 20. And I can see the values are indeed greater than 20. So I can similarly do this here. Maybe I'm interested in gear greater than three. And so now I see there are 17 cars with gear greater than three and I can scroll around to see those. And so I'm assuming they're mostly four. I don't know a lot about cars though. I'll be honest. All right. So there's a lot of different things that we can do with this besides greater than or less than. Um, we can ask if it's exactly equal to a particular value. And so in this case, we're going to need two equal signs. And the reason we need two is we're often assigning things, like we assign our arguments values when we use a single equal sign. So this is why we need two in this case. If we want to see that it's not equal to something, so find all the values that are not exactly equal to this, then we would just put um, the exclamation mark and one equal sign. If we want to do less than or greater than and equal to, we would do this, which is the, the greater than or less than sign first, and then the equal sign. And then we have our and and our or. And these are helpful for combining multiple conditions together. And so and um, is the ampersand key, which is likely at the top of your keyboard. And then this is known as a pipe or um, some other things, but it's often under your delete key on the far right. Um, a lot of common issues that happen with filter is that you misspell the column name. If you do that, then filter is going to say it doesn't exist. Um, and that makes sense because it's trying to filter something that's not a part of your data. Or you already filtered out or you, you selected out that column and then there's no column that actually exists. So that's something to watch out for. All right, so let's try some examples here. So here I have some compound examples. I am taking my TV data. I'm looking for all the values that are greater than 20 for MPG. And this can be specified by a comma also or an and. I suggest that you ignore the comma, don't use it, because it's much harder to tell whether this is an or or an and than when we specify it. Um, but just so you know, that would do the same as an and. So it has to be greater than 20 for MPG and cylinder has to be exactly equal to four. And we can see here that indeed the cylinder values are four. They're not 4.1, they're four. It's very specific about how it'll look for that. And so if you wanted all the range of values from four to five, you would wanna say, you know, greater than four and less than five. Um, and then we see that MPG is still greater than 20. If we wanted to try the OR statement, we're gonna get um, something slightly different. So here we see now we have cylinder values of six or four and probably some other values. And we have a table that's size 14. And here we only had 11 values. So we have a few more values that qualify with this condition because it's a little more flexible. It had to either be greater than 20 for MPG or have exactly equal to cylinder of four. So you can see here that when we had a cylinder of six, um, in this case, we happen to be greater than 21, but <laughs> this could be um, 18 or something. All right. And that, but sometimes we have multiple things that we want to say it's exactly equal to. And it's annoying to write that out. <laughs> so um, instead of writing out MPG is exactly equal to 20 or it's exactly equal to 21, 
or it's exactly equal to 22, we can just use this nifty in operator. So it's a percent sign around the word in, and then we can use our, our combine function to specify a list or vector of values. And so um, in this case, there just happens to only be things that are exactly equal to 21. So we only have a couple of values. Um, and then if you wanted to do, you could, you could combine this with multiple variables. So here we're looking at gear with specific values of four or five. And we're looking also, again, an and would be better, cylinder um, that's exactly equal to six or five. And so we have four or six and just six for cylinder because there just happens to be those values. Okay. Um, it's important to be really careful with the way that you work with filter. <laughs> so we want to avoid putting quotes around the names of the variables because R is going to get confused and it's going to be thinking this is a character string when in fact we're asking it to look for a variable. And so if you do this, you can see here that the output is not what we want. We have values that are less than 20 listed here. And our dimensions are 32 by 12. And if I look at the dimensions, I could do it down here, up here, I could do it here if I wanted to save it. I can see that it has the original dimensions. So I have not filtered my data whatsoever. So it's really important to not put quotes around your variable names. And this is in our table that we just showed you on the website. However, remember sometimes you have these weird column names that you get from collaborators or data that you find online. And so um, if you tried to do this with that, um, again, here's an atypical name. It's got some fancy punctuation marks in it. Again, if I try to use quotes, it's not going to work correctly, and I'm going to get I'm going to get the same value. So that's why it's really important to do a couple of things. Um, you could use backticks though, and that will work. But the way around this is um, I'm going to go past for just a second. Is to check each each of your steps. Did your dimensions change? If it didn't then you probably didn't filter. <laughs> um, and also, you know, renaming your, your values to something nice, then you don't have to worry about any of this. You don't have to worry about this just doing nothing, giving you an output of zero this is bad. So this happens if you have a character vector. Um, here, I'm saying it's exactly equal to Ferrari Dino and I get, I get that value out nicely. So I have to put quotes around the value, but not the variable. So the value is the values within our rows. And for character variables, I have character strings and they have words in them. And I have to put those in quotes, but the variable name, I do not. Again, the way to make sure that everything went okay is to check, did your dimensions change? check the values, are they what you expected? Um, and again, try to just avoid doing this if you can and just rename your data so it doesn't have these values. All right, um, one other function that's really helpful is the distinct function. So sometimes we have, um, you know, lots of repeated values, and we just want to know how many unique values do we have for a particular variable. So in this case, I want to know what cylinder values. I'd actually asked this before when I was talking about filtering. I thought, well, I think, I don't know how many cylinders there might be in this. Um, and so here I, I can say distinct TB the data that I'm using and the variable I'm interested in, and it gives me the unique values of those. So 
I could do a different variable. I could say distinct V gear. And I get these values. Now, if it's a variable that has lots of numeric values, this isn't going to be super useful. Um, I think there's a weight, yeah, a weight variable. And, you know, okay, I get 29 values. But it can be useful if it's something like this variable for cylinder gear, where I don't have very many. And that's, uh, it's useful to see there. If I wanted to do multiple values at once or variables at once, I can do cylinder and gear simultaneously just with a comma, and it tells me the unique values for each of those or the distinct values for each of those. If I do select, I get every value. I'm just pulling, uh, selecting this column. I don't want to say pull because pull will give me my values too, but in a non-tibble form. So I'm selecting that particular column and I'm getting a tibble that's just that column. So basically I'm just saying, show me a tibble, but only that column. But when I say distinct, I'm asking for the unique or distinct values of that variable. And so now I only have three values. Okay, so in summary for this part, um, Pull is what we use to get the values out of um, a table. So if I wanted to just see all of the values in a non-tibble form, I use pull. If I want to see them in a nice tibble format or table-like format, I would use select. Now it's again 32 by one. It's the dimensions of the original data set. I can select based on patterns in the column name. So I can do things like start with C or ends with state, that can be really useful. I can combine these together with a comma or an and or an or. Again, comma is the same as and. I can select based on column class by using the where function. So this is where I had where is numeric, where is character, that can be really useful. Um, and I can combine multiple patterns within a helper function like this, just with a comma. Note that these always have quotes around them because I'm asking for a character pattern, so it needs quotes. But inside filter, if I use a variable name, I do not use quotes. So what I mean by that is I don't say TD cylinder is equal to four. Then I get nothing, even though we know that that's not true. So if I I want to really avoid doing that to variable names, um, so filter is what it's doing is it's filtering out our rows based on log logical conditions, whereas select is working on our columns. You need to use the double equal sign for equivalent to, exactly equal to, not just a single equal sign. And means that both the conditions must be met, or means one or the other. And uh, distinct helps us find the unique values. OK, and now we're ready to try some of this out. And hopefully, it'll help it sink in. Okay. All right, this next part is basically combining some things. So we're showing that you can combine filter and select and do things simultaneously. So we can take the select function and then inside that, this is called nesting, we can put the filter function and we're saying within the TB data set, I want to filter for row values that have MPG greater than 20. But then afterwards, I want to just select the cylinder data. I know this looks a little bit intense because there's a lot going on in there and I have an alternative and it's coming. So, but yeah, this is how you would do it if you didn't have these extra tools that I'm gonna show you about. 
So this is called nesting, like I said. Um, and here, here's another version. I'm selecting these columns and then I'm using the head function to get the first two rows. And so I have my car column and my cylinder column of the TV data set and I see the first two rows. So it works, but it's a little bit hard to read, I think. So when we start to do something really complicated like this, it can be a little bit confusing, right? So there's a strategy to avoid this. And I'm just skipping over this because I don't think we need to actually try to parse what's happening because I'm gonna show you better ways. So what we could do is assign temporary objects. So we could say, let's filter TB, do MPG greater than 20 and cylinder is exactly equal to four. And we're gonna assign this to something called TB2. And then now that we've made this new object, I can take that and I can select these columns. So I'm sort of doing two steps here, right? And if I wanted to, I could reassign this to TB. That's one way to do it if I wanted to. Um, it's a way that people often do. So here I'm just looking at the head. It's the same values, same exact process. Or what's even better, because then we don't end up with all these extra objects and we don't know what they are. It's even better to use what's called the pipe. And this will, if you have been using R and haven't been using the pipe, it's revolutionary um, because it makes it much easier to do sequential steps. And we don't have to do the nasty looking nesting stuff. So it's this kind of weird looking symbol. It's a percent sign a greater than sign and a percent. And we can sort of think of things as statements. Um, I know that a lot of you really like shortcuts, so you can use command or control shift M depending on your, whether you have a Windows or Mac. And so what we're gonna do is take our data, pipe it into filter, uh, and then we're gonna take you know, our conditions. And then we're going to select these columns. So personally, I find this much more intuitive to understand and find this much very, very helpful, especially if we have really, really complicated things. It's nice to break things up into pieces. So we can think of it as a then word. Um, and so we'll be using the pipe Quite a bit soon. Um, adding and removing columns. Sometimes we just want to get rid of a column or we might want to add one. So this is the adding way or the tidyverse way to add a column. It's using the mutate function. Um, and so this is kind of a tricky one, uh, but we'll we'll get through it together. So this is the general form. You always have to reassign your data. You use the function, the data that you want to use. You could pipe your data into the mutate function as well. Um, but then you would have the new variable that you're making and then the source after an equal sign, just like the rename function. So in this case, we are making a new column called new column or new call. And we're using the weight variable. And we're going to divide, it, divide each of the values by 2.2. And so we can see here, after we create the data, that each of these values is the value of weight divided by 2.2. So a really powerful function. So we don't have to just make new variables with mutate. We can also modify existing variables. So we can similarly do the same setup where we have a reassignment, the data that we're using, and the on the after the equal sign, the variable that we're using as source. In this case, we're going to multiply it by two. But this time, instead of putting a new name for a new variable, we overwrite the existing weight variable. 
And so now when we look at this, our weight variable is, you know, values like five and six, whereas we just had, this is our half value. So as you recall, these were values around two. So we've modified the weight variable and now the values are twice as large. And we did both of these things with the same mutate function. And I know we don't have a lot of, we just have a few minutes left of class, so don't worry, we'll go over more of this again tomorrow. Just wanna give you a heads up. Again, we, so we can use our pipe and make things a little bit easier, um, and just get used to this idea. You don't have to, but you can pipe your data into the mutate function. Kind of makes it slightly looking cleaner looking, so you can just focus on what's inside the mutate parentheses. And so now we're just going back, we're make, taking the weight variable and we're dividing it by two, getting it back to its original state. We can also remove columns uh, just using the select function and a minus sign. So mutate is how we add or modify columns. If we wanna remove them, we can just say select minus new column, or we can just simply select the columns that we want and ignore the ones that we don't. If we wanna do this with multiple columns, we use the combine function, just like this. We have the minus sign, combine, and the variable names. Ordering columns. Okay, so, Again, you may remember that I showed you earlier that depending on how you select your columns, you can reorder them. So if I say that I decide I want cylinder first, I can select so that cylinder shows up first before MPG, et cetera. In this case, I'm only selecting four columns, so I'm also getting rid of a bunch of columns, but I can do other things with select to make sure that I keep all of those and rearrange them. So there's a nifty function, it's another tidy helper function called everything. And I can move my column before all the rest of the columns or after if I use the everything function. In this case, I'm doing it before. So I'm saying, I want my new column to show up before everything else. And here it is. or I can move it to the end. In this case, I have to do slightly more work. I have to say, first remove it, then give me everything, then put it at the end, which is kind of annoying, um, but doable. There's another function though, that can make it a little easier, especially if you wanna do something more fancy. Um, and I thought I had it right there, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I can also order using a function called order, which is part of base R. So this basically figures out the alphabetical order and it prints out the numeric values for those. So if I apply this, if I say select, order the column names of TB, it will column, it will order them in alphabetical order. So if you ever needed to order by alphabet, this is how you could do that. And that's nice because you moving one column at a time would be very tedious. But it's the relocate function that I was talking about, which is where you can move things around in a in a simpler way. So say we wanna do something a little more complicated and we want weight to be before cylinder. So it's not really at the beginning, it's not at the end, kind of in the middle. I could relocate weight. So I'd say, I wanna work with TB. I wanna relocate weight and I want it before the cylinder variable. And it will put it right there before my cylinder variable. <laughs> 
So this is a really useful function if you have a more complicated relocation. All right, we have one minute left. I don't think that's enough. We're almost there though. <laughs> so, um, and we can go through some of these examples more slowly too. That way tomorrow before the lab, you're fresh on what these ideas are before we jump into lab three. We can use the arrange function to order rows. So in this case, we're arranging TV by the values of MPG. So it's going to, by default, do it in ascending order or increasing order. So it starts with the smallest values and increases those values. So we can use select and to, to arrange or reorder our columns, whereas the arrange function is for rows. And we're going to do this based on a particular column. We can also do this in descending order. So if we wanted to instead show the top values and go decreasing from there, we would use the DESC function, which is a base R function, but stands for descending. So here I'm arranging the values within the TV data set for the MPG variable in descending order. And in this case, it kind of needs to be nested just like this. Um, and then trying to find my RStudio window. We could give you some examples now that we got to new material. <laughs> what is it? Do you see me moving around? Okay, good. Yep. All right. So let's see if I still have my data from last time. Oh, we do. Okay, great. So just to show you another example. Um, I could, if I wanted to, pipe in my data instead of putting it inside. And let's say that we want to order by cylinder. And let's just arrange in ascending order. So it'll be the lowest values first. So now all my values are four cylinders first. That one's not as exciting looking as say maybe disk, so I'm gonna to switch to that. Not sure what disk means, <laughs> unfortunately. Anybody who knows cars, maybe you know what that means. It's displacement. Ah, okay. I know what MPG is, so that's-, yeah. that's... It's however big the, the volume of the engine is. Ah, okay. That makes sense here. So here we're seeing some pretty large display, displacement values for low MPGs. Um, so the Cadillac Fleetwood, I can use this to identify which value of car has the lowest MPG. Or if I wanted the highest, I would add the DEC function. I have to close my parentheses. And I see that the Toyota Corolla, which has a very small disc, um, has a really um, much better MPG. Thanks for that, Cliff. <laughs> All right. So we, we really got close last time, um, but I think all we had left was arranging rows. So in summary, you can combine select and filter together. Um, you can do this in sequential steps in a few different ways. You can do the nesting that looks kind of intense um, where, you know, we technically have a little bit of nesting here. We have descending working first and then we arrange, um, but we can see how that gets pretty unwieldy quickly if we have lots of, lots of things happening. So it's nice to be able to, for example, at least pipe in the data.
And so that's why pipes can be really helpful. We talked about how select is for reordering columns. We can select the ones that we want if we want to just get rid of something, or we can use that minus sign to get rid of something. Um, and relocate is especially useful for fancy relocations. Arranges for rows. You can remove rows with filter, just a reminder, and you remove columns with select. The mutate function is super powerful, and that's for um, creating our new variables or modifying existing variables. It kind of works for the definition of mutate, the word. So that's what that's about. And then I just wanted to call to your attention in case you've seen this, because some of you are a little bit familiar with R, um, that you may have seen this dollar sign operator. And if you're new to R, you might encounter it because it's um, the base R way of, of doing poll. And so we you'll you'll possibly see this with your collaborators. And so if you see this, you'll know, okay, they're using essentially pull here. This is um, simple because you only have to write one character, but it's much harder to interpret what this means, right? If I were to say, I'm going to pull carb from TB basically with the code, that's a lot easier to read and interpret than I'm going to dollar sign carb. Like, what does that mean? That's, that's hard for people who aren't used to R. Um, and similarly, you don't need mutate for base R. Mutate is a tidyverse function. Um, you would simply just overwrite or create a new column by writing it with the dollar sign. You don't need to do, know how to do this. I'm just letting you know that this is how you might encounter other people writing their code. Um, and while it uses fewer characters and it might feel like it's saving time, it's uh, again, much harder to interpret what's happening here, as opposed to I'm mutating the weight variable and creating a new column that's the division of 2.2 for weight. I think this is a much harder thing to read and see that, especially if you're not used to it. All right. So with that, um, we are done with subsetting and we're gonna go do the lab part three.